forget what I just I just said right there. All right, uh, thanks everybody for joining. I uh, really appreciate you coming out. My name is again is Addison Graham. I'm the co-president of Brailbirds here at ISU. Uh, sitting over there is uh, Nicole Martin. She's the other co-president. Uh, and then sitting in the second row, we have uh, Jillian. She's the president of Deaf Redbirds. Uh, so we put together, uh, Jillian and I, put together this uh, event as a, as a means to help educate uh, Gen Ed and other undergraduate education majors, special education as well, uh, to give them a better understanding of the referral processes, as well as uh, some of the assessments and evaluations that go into uh, referring a student who has low vision blindness or deaf and hard of hearing. Oftentimes, uh, these disabilities can be overlooked, maybe as an unwillingness to cooperate in the classroom, uh, maybe as a behavioral problem, uh, but if it's not addressed, it can go years without the child receiving the proper support uh, that they need to have a successful educational career and beyond. So I just, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, so we have set up uh, two tables with L uh, low vision and blindness professors and uh, deaf and hard of hearing. I'm going to allow... Um, Professor Katie Hansen to introduce herself, and then they're going to go just one person say a, a hi and uh, their name. So, Katie, would you like to start? Just the name? Yep. I'm Katie Hansen. Oh. Sure, that's a great idea. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to give more information okay, than just because yeah, I feel like it. Um, I'm Katie Hansen, and I run clinicals for the Low Vision and Blindness Department at ISU. Um, I worked here since 2009. Um, five years of that was in the lab schools uh, as a TBI, and then past that I've been in clinicals ever since. And I currently am doing practicum field-based and student teaching. And student teaching, I take deaf and hard of hearing candidates. Am I going too fast? No, no, oh. I fix it. Uh, deaf and hard of hearing candidates, low vision and blindness, and learning and behavior. Um, so I have my hand in all those kind of areas. I also have another part-time job on top of that where I um, am a teacher for the visually impaired. So um, one of the benefits I feel like I bring is I'm currently an active teacher uh, in the K-12 schools. All right, my name is Amy Lund, and I am also a teacher of students that are blind or visually impaired. I am at the lab school, so I'm at Metcalf and U High currently. Um, but I did teach in Springfield, Illinois for 17 years, and so I was itinerant, traveling from school to school. Um, so that was a, a little different than just being in two buildings. I am currently uh, just adjuncting and teaching Nemeth, and working with the students on their math braille, which is a lot of fun for me. My name is Mindy Ely, and I am the Low Vision and Blindness Professor, one of them. Um, here at ISU. Before that, I was mostly in early intervention, so working with kids birth to three who are blind or visually impaired, and then before that was in the schools. Um, my area of interest is cerebral visual impairment, and so that's where I do most of my most of my work. Hello, I'm Steph Gardner Walsh. I go by G Dubs here. Um, I am faculty in deaf and hard of hearing. I am hard of hearing myself prior to being here in Illinois. I was a teacher of the deaf in North Carolina, um, first at the School for the Deaf and then at, in the public school system in Durham, and then in the public school system in rural Davie County as an itinerant teacher. Okay, um, my name is Molly May and I'm a student teacher in the deaf and hard of hearing. I did experience at the Eleanor School for the Deaf, Ridgewood's in Peoria, and now currently we're both at the Wisconsin School for the Deaf. Hi, I'm Sarah Hallade. Um, I'm also a student teacher currently. I was at Carl Auditory Oral School last semester. Um, I just finished up a uh, placement at Hinsdale South High School, and I'm now at Wisconsin School for the Deaf, working with elementary. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. 
so how we're going to uh, kick this off is I'm going to be sitting in the front row and then um, I'm going to direct a topic of inquiry towards the LBV table, then towards the DHH table, uh, same topic. Uh, whoever would like to speak, I can hand the microphone off to you, and then after that person is done giving their initial statement, um, anyone from any of the tables uh, can interject, give their opinion, um, or build off of the original statement. So I'm going to move over that front table, or this row there. Okay, so for the LPB table, um, discussing common indicators, uh, that is behavioral, social, academic, etc., that a student's gen ed teacher would notice in the classroom that might suggest a referral or LPB assessment or evaluation. Who would like to go first? Sure. <laughs> Uh, first, I will advocate for the screeners, making sure that all students in the buildings, when they're in kindergarten, they get screeners, when they are in second, third, um, those are a start. Um, these are not, you know, our students that are in the low vision blindness program are not the ones that just need glasses. Sometimes glasses doesn't even fix it. So what you're looking for are you know, is it the clumsy kid who trips a lot? Well, maybe they're missing the lower hemisphere of their vision. Is it the kid that has eccentric viewing? So there's that constant head tilt, and they're doing all of their work in a certain area of the table. So their paper's here, their head tilts there. That's kind of like the signs, the physical features that you might notice in a gen ed class um, on top of, you know, the board work, the distance work. Those are indicators for, at least for it to get checked. And then from there, see if there's any other conditions, glaucoma, cataracts, things that they need to investigate more at the doctor's level. Yeah, that's great. I'll add to that. So a few years ago, eligibility criteria was that the student had to have a visual acuity of 20 over 70 or worse in the better eye with correction. That definition has changed to being an adverse effect on the child's academic performance. So what does that mean? It can mean a lot of things. Um, I remember when my first year of teaching, I had a second grader and um, I was called in for a referral and the teacher was kind of giving me some information about the student. She said, oh yeah, the student, you know, he's, he's kind of getting close to some things when we're working you know, at near, and he's really like squinting a lot when we're reading from the board. She goes, and he goes to the bathroom a lot, like a lot, a lot. Um, and so what I would suggest at that point is, let's start the referral process. So a parent can start that process, so can any teacher or staff in the building if they have a vision concern. Um, part of that process is going to get their eyes checked and hopefully an ophthalmologist's office, but an optician would also work making sure that if they have a glasses prescription, it's appropriate. Um, and if they don't, do they need one? Um, and then we would come in and do an assessment and we typically call that a functional vision and learning media assessment. So we would come in with a bunch of stuff in our kit. We would test the students, uh, work with the student, observe the student in their classroom, uh, talk to the teachers and parents, uh, and get a lot of that good background data, and then um, write a report based on that. Okay. Um, turns out the second grader that I was talking about, he ended up having type 1 diabetes, which explains the constantly going to the bathroom, but visually he had some issues in his retina, which is a very common thing with diabetes, um, which was causing the visual impairment. So uh, be careful, don't be just looking for, you know, the common eye stuff. It could be behavioral stuff too that's affecting their, their um, academic performance that could be back, related back to the vision. One thing I'll add, because I know a lot of you are, are um, have a deafness background, so there's a difference between deaf and um, between visual impairment. Uh, we, our um, consideration for visual impairment is, um, has to do with how well they're seeing in the better eye with correction. So just, if you're totally blind in one eye and see just fine in the other, that's not considered a visual impairment. It has to be impacting 
Um, but what we're looking at, the better eye with best correction, which usually means with glasses on. Um, and
will or will not qualify. And so every state is different. The criteria is different by state, but we do have that label of an adverse effect. So a kid who has one hearing ear and one deaf ear can qualify if it is negatively impacting. Um, but kids who are hard of hearing but not negatively impacted are not considered hard of hearing even though they are hard of hearing. <laughs> it's, it's a hot mess. Um, and we are, we're working to kind of unify this definition. Um, but one thing that I have noticed a lot is um, kids who have Usher syndrome, which will result in deaf blindness, um, many of our deaf kids will be screened for that early. Um, however, sometimes they are missed, especially kids who are moving around a lot or are not following up with the plethora of medical interventions that they need. And so things like that are actually, we notice visual things. Kids cannot see the stars at night or tripping a lot. And it's really not because of the deafness, which could be a balanced thing, but it's actually because their vision is starting to tunnel in and so they're missing and they don't notice the, the lower or the higher or the sides missing and, and things are becoming dark. And for those kids, it's really important to find them early because they're going to lose both the, the hearing and the vision and we have to decide how to communicate best. Um, and so we see that um, my other little soapbox is many of the kids that general education teachers find are the hard of hearing kids um, because the doctor will say they are hearing enough, but we know 50% of kids with unilateral one-sided deafness will fail one grade academically and about the same percentage for a mild, which mild for you as adults is not even thought of as a hearing loss, but for a kid is critical because of language development. Uh, relating back uh, to the discussion point, do any of the LVD uh, professors give any more points of inquiry or interest that you'd like to talk about before moving on? I will say, there is no such thing as a universal newborn vision screening. And the reason for that is that you're not born with a full visual system. It develops within the first year to 18 months of life. And so therefore you can't do a vision screening in the hospital like they can do hearing in the hospital. Hearing is done when you're born, vision is not. So that's why we don't have that, which means that our parents have to, or just like average Joe Blow parent, has to bring their child in for a uh, follow-up check, which the, the pediatrician is supposed to do that at well checks, which are supposed to happen at three, six, and, and yeah, they're supposed to have it. Supposed to. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing is, is that how often do you see a kid that's visually impaired? And so they quickly do the vision and check that off the list. But you really have to take time to do a full look at how a child, what a child's vision is. And so our kids get missed because you can't look at the visual system until they're a bit older and at that point unless it's real obvious nobody's taking the time to really check it out so so that's kind of how that works but there is no such thing as newborn um, uh, universal newborn vision screen uh, I did want to add just like Steph had said that when any teacher or anyone makes a referral for the special ed process so whether it is a, a hearing concern or a vision concern or a learning concern they will do, or they should, do those vision and hearing screenings. So no matter how, whatever the difficulties are precipitating in a classroom, they will start with, is it sensory? Or, you know, and see, I don't wanna say eliminate, but they wanna kind of go through what, what, what could it be most, more first? Is it any of the sensory things? Then they're gonna go down and see if there's other um, tests that need to be made. So I did wanna add that. Yeah. Then for the DHH professors um, and student teachers, are there any other more points of inquiry or interest that you'd like to discuss before moving on? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> I can always talk. Um, I'm going to add to yours. What's really interesting for a learning disability is the first thing that you have to be able to say to label a learning disability is that you are not deaf or blind. 
And so historically, we were not allowed to have a kid who was deaf who was also um, dyslexic. Now that's wrong, but that's the way the test was set up. We have ways to do it now through RTI, but the original test said that you could not be blind and have LD, you could not be deaf and have LD. You also couldn't be gifted and, and deaf, so I mean there's that problem too, right? So, um, or gifted with LD, and we, we know that that can happen. So the LD screening has some flaws as well, many. <laughs> Moving on to the next uh, discussion point, uh, what are some, for, this is for the LVB professors, what are some common supports, or, uh, modifications, accommodations uh, that might be expected of a student um, who has low vision blindness in a general education classroom? The list is very long and very dependent on the unique students' needs and strengths. Um, so I'll just start by saying that. But uh, typically, when you're looking at a student with low vision, we're looking at this kind of range of um, where we might have a field loss going on, so maybe they're not seeing the upper quadrant or the lower quadrant. Um, they might have some peripheral loss, so a couple eye conditions will cause that tunnel vision, like Steph was saying earlier about um, ushers. Um, or they could have a central loss and they could also have an acuity loss, which means the clarity of their vision is going down, right? Um, and typically what we're looking for for low vision is around the range of 2070 when you do your acuity 2070. And what that means for those who may not be familiar is what a typically sighted person could see at 70 feet away, that person would have to be 20 feet away to see with the same amount of clarity. Does that make sense? Um, so that ranges between 2070 and 2200-ish, okay? That's a big range. Um, and so that's why it's really important to get that evaluation done and done really thoroughly so that you can very specifically identify those accommodations and get those correct. Um, we typically don't start looking at Braille as an accommodation or an instructional source until the student is at around 2200 vision or if the student's vision is at any level but they have a degenerative condition. So for example, um, give me a degenerative condition. Star grades. Or right now, yeah, either one, RP or star grades. So um, with these conditions, students will gradually lose the vision over time, okay? And if we know that that vision is gonna decrease to the point where they would need braille, we need to start that braille instruction immediately, okay? Um, and that would also be the point where you would typically be looking at um, orientation and mobility instruction as well. So use of that white cane, maybe a guide dog down the line, lots of safety um, instruction and things like that. As far as classroom accommodations, the list is so exhaustive, um, but basically you're looking at ways to help either the clarity of vision um, or the access to the material. access. Um, that can include enlargement, and we've got lots of assistive technology that can support that, um, as well as just having the teacher enlarge papers and materials and books. Um, we also do a lot of things that can reduce the things that are keeping them from having access. So for example, if they're sitting at a desk and their paper is flat on the desk and the paper has a sheen to it, we may have glare bouncing off of that paper. Right? So one of the things that we can do is maybe use a slant board to kind of lift that paper up, create a shadow where the glare isn't shining off of it as bad. Um, another thing that you might want to think about is isolation of visual stimuli, which means uh, what we're wanting to do is isolate the target of their vision. What, what are we looking at in order to reduce the amount of things that they're trying to scan and find and make it much simpler. So for example, on a math worksheet, you may have a math problem, math problem, math problem all across the page. Maybe we're using some sort of uh, black card with a hole cut out to just isolate that one math problem, which is gonna allow them to kind of very clearly focus in um, on those things. There's just a couple. Um, like Katie said, there are lots, like, and it's exhaustive, and 
it should be individualized to whatever the student needs. And so after 21 years of teaching, I could go through a long list of highlighters and line markers and um, desk lamps. Slant boards are just using binders to slant materials forward. The assistive technology that makes things larger, things that could actually sometimes make your things smaller helps. So to, if you have that field loss and you're, you know, you can't, you can't be too big because it'll be outside of what you can actually see. Um, so just a wide variety of that, as well as talking graphing calculators, specific software. So having screen readers, um, screen enlargers, or software on computers or uh, tablets, braille note taking devices, refreshable braille displays. So the braille actually pops up under their fingers so they can read the braille as well as listen to it. So they're getting some dual modality of listening and tactile. Um, goodness. There's so many. <laughs> um, you know, the use of Braille, the use of Nemeth code, which is the Braille math code. Um, but there's other things that we have to then look at, and it's how are we learning how to set the table, make our bed, pick out clothes, cook, do laundry. So all of those daily living skills, independent living skills, we do start addressing very early on in the expanded core curriculum for low vision blindness. So making sure that I'm giving them strategies on how to use a measuring cup and a leveling system so that they know that they have the ingredients that they need in that. Maybe using the strategy of having a big baking sheet so they have a spill tray so it doesn't spill everywhere. They're able to contain any kind of overflow. Um, lots of strategies like that to help make them more independent and foster that independence in their future. Uh, I'll go grab some of the materials and be talk. Organization is also key for our Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm gonna make some really bold uh, or broad sweeping statements, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But when I think of what we do as teachers of the visually impaired, and I'm since most of you are, are either vision or deaf, I'll just compare the two. My thought between the comparison, we'll see if you agree with me on this. We rarely teach academics. As TVIs, our job is, is pretty much adapting stuff. So um, making it bigger, making it smaller, making the lighting better, all those things that these guys just talked about. And then what, what we teach is called the expanded core curriculum. So what we teach is specialized skills. So one of the expanded core areas is the compensatory skills and under that falls Braille. That's one of a whole host of things. We're teaching things like, um, like uh, uh, efficient uh, visual, visual efficiency. So using, uh, and we teach things like orientation mobility. Although orientation mobility is really big, uh, take more of that. Technology is a huge part of what we teach. So anyway, there's nine different areas in the ECC, but, and those are the things we teach. The whole purpose behind that is to lead to have a healthy adult. And so um, we're looking beyond the school day into lifelong skills for living. Okay, now let me make a broad statement that you can correct me if I'm totally off. I think deaf educators, on the other hand, focus a lot on linguistics, communication, and language skills. Yeah, so our focus is like, it's like broad just living with vision loss which includes reading. And you guys are very language focused. Yeah. And also you teach like core academics, yeah. right? Yeah, we hardly ever teach academics. Yeah, and I would, I would say that that varies state by state. Really in the public school system, the way that itinerants are, they should be doing only the expanded common core and only the deaf schools and the self-contained classrooms doing academic. But we see a lot of administrators who don't understand our job. And so we are Great. given, none. Yeah, <laughs> like, like none of us. And so it varies and many times we have to become the advocates for what our jobs are. And we are not the speech teacher and we are not the audiologist and we are not the interpreter and we are not the teacher of the, of the blind because people don't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I know the dots, totally. <laughs> The dots. <laughs> um, I can only cuss. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, honestly, I, I joke about that all the time, but we all know that there are so many times that it's like, oh, you teach deaf kids, do you know Braille? <laughs> Same. Or, oh, like, like I'm signing in public and somebody hands me the Braille menu and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> If it's coming to a student um, who is deaf and hard of hearing in like maybe a mainstream classroom, so they're not in a self-contained, um, that can mean making sure they're placed in the classroom um, in a place that makes sense, maybe close to the front of the room to the teacher. Um, if that student and their parents have decided that the best mode of communication for them is sign language, then they have an interpreter. Um, if they use auditory oral, so they have a hearing aid um, or a cochlear implant, or they just use auditory oral, that they're placed close to the teacher. Um, they can hear the teacher easily by being closer to them. Um, a lot of times, um, windows, if there's like a glare or something on the teacher, it's hard to see their lips. That could be issues. Background noise, if they're right near a fan or an air conditioner, obviously that's going to um, not be beneficial for that student who has a hearing loss and is now hearing a fan behind them. Um, and that also means they have their FM system in the classroom if they use that. Um, and so. Um, I've worked with a lot of these technologies in my student teaching placements, um, and in the last one I was at, at Hinsdale South, I was, um, one of the classrooms I was with was students with multiple disabilities. So it was vision and deaf and hard of hearing and autism and learning disabilities all in one classroom. And um, out of the seven kids that I had, five of them had a one-on-one -on -one aid. So it was um, a really, really interesting and really great placement. Um, but. It was, you know, seeing those slant boards that they were using um, and also signing with that kid. Um, they had, you know, um, when we went out on trips around the community, they were using their cane. Um, we, the orientation and mobility came with on some of those field trips um, and we're signing with that kid and they have an interpreter, but they're also talking about scanning, you know, to look for things in the grocery store, to um, where's the ice cream? Okay, let's look back and forth. Um, am I cutting in and out? Okay. Is that any better? Okay. Um, so there's also, we would have word searches that we would do to just look for words um, to match them to the vocabulary words we've been working on in the classroom. And seeing a bunch of those letters for the kids who also have a vision loss is very overwhelming. So we would um, like have pieces of paper to like make the, where the word was a smaller field to look so then they could easily find, okay, here's the P and there's the next letter I need, just going down um, that way. So um, it was actually really interesting. I would just like to add a little bit onto what you were saying was, she was talking about having an interpreter and having preferential seating that way, but also if your student doesn't use sign language, Instead of giving them preferential seating, you can try your best to change the seating for everyone so they can see who everyone is to see what they're saying. The best way is like that. It doesn't always work in a classroom of 30 kids, but anything that can help that. Also, if they don't have an interpreter and you have preferential seating would be the front row, they're not seeing and they probably are not hearing what is going on behind them. So repeating what students are saying, anything that, um, is involved with that would be repeat. I mean, we do it still, even if it is signing, because sometimes they're not sitting like that. Sometimes they're not even looking at that person because socially, they high schoolers don't like each other. They don't like each other, so they refuse to look at that person. So then you got to sign to them, and it's just things like that. Um, also, closed captioning if they don't use an interpreter, even if they use an interpreter, closed captioning still is. Even for hearing, I use closed captioning all the time, and it just clears up so much in my life. Um, yeah. That was going to be my next soapbox. <laughs> um, You're welcome. There's... There we go. I knew I brought this for a reason. 
Um, there is a difference between captions and craptions. <laughs> I'm gonna say that again. Captions, craptions. There's a, a new sign for you all. Um, so craptions, like the automatically generated captions, are a good start. But if you watch anything that has automatically transcribed captions, they're not accurate. So if you're testing a kid on the content that they absorbed through the craptions, um, they're not going to be accurate. And so you're actually testing the captions. On, on YouTube, you can go in and edit many things. If you're making your own videos, you can do that. Um, DCMP.org has free access to describe for the blind um, and caption for the deaf resources, free for all teachers and families with either deaf or blind students and people who are deaf or blind themselves, that you can get in there and find free resources on so many different topics. So there's no excuse not to caption something. Um, we know that the captioning not only supports deaf and hard of hearing students, but second language users, students with learning disabilities, and those with attention disabilities, not to mention those of you who are watching your phones while doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. Um, so those are really, that's a big thing to know. Even right now with Zoom, the automatic captions are captions. Um, and so be aware that they're there, they support, but they do not get full access for that information. Um, the other thing that I want to say is our programs are the most expensive programs. We have the smallest population and the biggest bills. Um, the technology that we have, that's $3,000. This little piece right here, $75. This piece here, $50. I go through four of those a week minimum. A pack with eight is about $6. That's about $1,500 for the whole system. And many times, like if you have a middle school kid and they're going from class to class and you have a system in each room, that is $1,500 for each classroom. And then the little thing that plugs into the hearing aid so that we can hear or the cochlear implant. The outside part of the cochlear implant is about $10,000. The internal part is covered by insurance because it's surgery. The external is not covered by insurance. And this is a cosmetic device by insurance standards. For those of you in vision, my insurance will cover breast implants for me because it is self-esteem, but it doesn't cover my hearing aids because this is cosmetic. So like my deaf ed majors know this already, but that is like, if, if you think about the cost for families, many times under the age of 26, they will cover more. But after that, you're on your own to figure out how to pay for this. And deaf and blind people are typically less employed than sighted and hearing people. So those are things to think about. Um, other things that are really important for technology is alert systems. Um, at night, I have a, a special alarm that vibrates the bed. I hate it, but I have it because I cannot hear with that at night. I had a special baby monitor for my girls, and then I gave up and just let my husband do it because I was feeding them. He can wake up. Um, but those things are important. The fire alarm blinking for me. Um, knowing the difference between the fire alarm and the tornado. I cannot hear the tornado siren, so I need an alert system. The government says that I have to depend on my phone. But if it's in the middle of the night, that phone is on the side of the bed. So how do you do that? Um, CO2 detectors, that's an alert system. In the school system, how do you know if there's a code red? I taught in a city school and I had to set up a system so that my kids knew that there was another gang fight there. 
and they had to get in. And we, we did have violence in the halls and my kids had no way of knowing except looking around and people were running. And so those were things that we had to figure out how do we set up these alert systems for them and then how do they contact me so that I know that they're safe because if not, I'm contacting the police and saying, hey, I've got deaf kids that I can't find. Um, and so that is, that is something that you kind of be aware of and it's expensive. Um, my fire alarm, instead of being like $30 for a typical one is 190. It's expensive. I'll hand it back down once. I was just gonna do a little show and tell real quick. And so this is a Kramer Abacus. And so how sighted students will do scratch paper, adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. Our students are able to do it on this. Um, I enjoy the tool. I know that it's not always, but it's that mental math that you're building before the calculator step. So we not is, a calculator. It's not a calculator, but it is that same as the scratch paper. So that's what this, it can hold the numbers, it can hold the place values, and it's a very meaningful tool before the calculator step. Um, I also want, this is a math window, and we have magnets that have braille numbers and math symbols, and so if you are showing um, kind of on the fly, you can have all of your magnets available and write the problem on the math window and the student can manipulate the magnets and kind of get the concepts before going to a braille writer, which is a little bit more cumbersome. We have them over on the table there. Um, so this is a really unique opportunity just to quickly uh, teach with and have the students solve on the math window and have everything ready to go. Manipulate, move stuff around a lot more easily than you can move braille. Like we can't erase braille as easily. So doing it on the magnetic board is really helpful. Um, and then you all should have a copy of the Braille alphabet and the opportunity to be able to fill in the dots to Braille your name. So that was just something fun that you guys could have. That's also really nice for uh, gen ed classes. If you're doing any kind of awareness and you wanna talk about the Braille code, it's not a language, it's a code. It's how we uh, translate out of English into a tactile code, kind of like Morse code. Um, so if you were doing some awareness, you could always pull out this worksheet with the Braille alphabet and how to Braille your name. Um, so kind of going back to like those alert systems in a school, um, something that I noticed when I was at my at Hinsdale South High School they didn't have a way in the hallways to let students know that there was an announcement that it was a shelter in place or there was a code red in the school or something. Um, and so they had to rely on either the teacher, if the teacher was hearing, um, or they had to rely on an interpreter running into the room and saying, hey, really quick, this is happening. Um, and so a lot of my teachers were advocating for hey, instead of putting this nine TV display board to put like this poster up next to the cafeteria, can we just put a TV at the end of the hallways? So if our student is in the hallway and it says shelter in place and they're heading to the bathroom, they can see that? Because it was in the middle of class, it was a shelter in place announcement. My teacher, uh, my CT and I were both hearing, so we hurried and we told the class what was happening, but our student was in the hallway and he was going to the bathroom and he didn't hear the announcement. And so my CT had to run over to the bathroom, get his attention that it was a shelter in place, he needed to come back to the classroom, but there was nothing in place in that school that there was something going on. Um, and so she had been advocating going to administration um, because at Hinsdale South High School, it's you know a public school, um, but there's a huge deaf ed program there. So there's about 65 to 70 deaf kids, it's a huge deaf ed program, but it's not a deaf school. So there weren't a lot of things in the hallways in place. Um, announcements every day, you either had to rely on the teacher interpreting it or the interpreter coming into the room if the teacher was deaf and doing interpreting for the announcements. Um, there wasn't a way to have like, you know, uh, the announcements like on the board or anything. Um, so that was something that also my teachers were advocating for of having them typed out so that the students could also go back to them if they wanted to. Um, so a lot of things like that in the school system. At Wisconsin School for the Deaf, they have a, like a digital board in the room. And so if there's anything other than a fire drill, the fire alarm, it's a red flashing light. 
for anything else, uh, tornado drill or um, like a shelter in place or you know intruder in the building, something, it's a blue light that flashes, which means look at the board and that um, little digital board says what is happening. So. Pass it down. <laughs> Can I add something? Yeah. Um, not all of our technology has to be high tech though. I have found like for deaf and hard of hearing kids, a whiteboard so that I can communicate with somebody else real quick. Like you can go to the dollar store and buy one and many different color markers. Um, so sometimes we think that like our technology support systems and our accommodations are like really whew, fancy, but I mean, sometimes just a, a creative simple solution is fine too. Real quick. Who is DHH? And whose vision? And who's LBS? I love that you're here. Way to go. Janet? What's your major? IT. IT. Yay! Yay for you. Yay for you. We, we all love you when you come to <laughs> um, I was just going to say, you know, to, to kind of wrap it into, well, a package that can't be wrapped into a package. Um, but the common theme between the UGH and LBB is access, right? So whatever we're doing to accommodate or to provide supports, it's hopefully to help the student access um, the general classroom, the special classroom, whatever classroom they're in, right? Um, but when we talk about specifically how we access those things, that's where we differ. Because DHH tends to use a lot of visual supports, whereas vision obviously can't do that most of the time, so we rely more on auditory and tactile. The tactile we both have in common. So if you have a student with dual loss, tactile is going to be that primary medium for learning. Okay. So kind of going off what Sarah was saying about announcements is one thing that I've always pushed for in high school is advocating for themselves. So at my high school, they had a student announcements and it was a video and sometimes they didn't have captions at all. Sometimes they were captions, never captions. So we went to the principal and we had them say that they don't have access to these announcements. Anything that was going through the speakers, not getting access to that either. And so they would have it written down in an email and that was the captions because that was their speech, but are we expecting our students to read that before they get to watch the video or watch the video and then read that after? Um, so we had them actually write a letter, all of them, to the principal explaining that the captions weren't there or they were not good. And so I think one other thing is besides access is advocating for themselves. At some point, they're gonna graduate high school, they're not gonna have a teacher to advocate for them. So when they're in the real world, they have to have those advocating skills for themselves to, if they go to a conference and they don't have any supports, how are they gonna advocate for themselves to get those supports? Or if they told someone beforehand that they need these supports and they're not there and they're legally required to be there, how are you gonna advocate for yourself that they should be there to begin with? So that's a totally different direction, but let's <laughs> talk about supports a little bit. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was great discussion. Is there any any one of the panelists have anything more to add to the secondary discussion point? All right, cool. We're going to open up the floor uh, to Q and A. Is there anyone that has any specific questions for any of the panelists regarding either uh, supports in the classroom, assessments, and evaluations for students who um, may qualify for? A low vision and blindness or bent and hard of hearing supports or lastly um, characteristics or behaviors of students who may have low vision and blindness or bent and hard of hearing or or anything <laughs> or anything anything at all <laughs> i'm just sorry teresa i'm calling you out um, I, while you're thinking about what to ask us, and seriously, you can ask me anything, I'm not going to judge you, and even if you phrase it weird, I will help you find the right language. Um, but if you have an interpreter in the room, 
as a teacher, there's a couple things to know. First off, they are a person. <laughs> and they're there to interpret. Um, they're not your paper copier. Okay? As a deaf user, if I don't feel like looking at the interpreter, I don't have to. Because just like as hearing people can tune out and think about something else in their head, I can tune out and think about something else in my head too. And I can also fake looking at her. Um, just like everybody else can fake listen and y'all do this thing. While you're shopping on Amazon. Like I know this. Um, talk directly to me as a deaf person. Not, can you please tell her that I like her shoes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like just to just talk directly. Um, and if you're if you're teaching with an interpreter, a great thing to be able to do is give your materials ahead of time because there's random vocabulary that we don't know. Okay, like your technical vocabulary, which is called tier three vocabulary. A lot of times we have to look those up because we don't remember the sign. We don't remember everything, or we've never used it. Um, and so just like you're having to learn those science words all over, the interpreter probably does too. And so give, give them a chance to work um, ahead of time so that they can find those vocabulary. And as a deaf user, I get to see those real words. Just really quick on top of that is not only the interpreter needs to learn those vocab words, but the student. Yeah. because. The interpreter can learn those vocab words all day long, but if they're signing them and the student doesn't know what it means, then they're missing the content of the lesson. So giving it to them ahead of time as well, so they can go to the student if they have like a study time or anything like that and say, these are your vocab words, this is the sign I will be using for them, or what signs do you have for them? Sorry, like if I'm hearing it, it's loud. <laughs> There's a buzzing. There's a buzzing. Because yeah. I can hear it. Yeah. And that doesn't happen often. Are my other hard of hearing people hearing it? No. Yeah, good. No. You're <laughs> too far. <laughs> You're too far. Like, I'm going to sit here and do a, a measurement on, on decibels. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Stop. Oh, stop. stop. As soon as you try. I'm going to measure you. It's just like it's weight taken. So, do you guys have questions? Woo! <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> okay, can y'all hear me? Okay. You get a mic. And you get a mic. <laughs> I might need your help like phrasing this question. But it's kind of about like working with other like maybe deaf educators, explore like um blind educators, especially in those schools for the deaf and blind folks. Um what is it like, I guess, especially when a lot of the teachers do not hold those identities. You find yourself kind of like arguing and maybe you have like two different ways of support or maybe someone in this field is not in the field for the right reasons in the sense of like how do you how do you point that out to them? How do you have those conversations? I'll start on the deaf side. <laughs> um, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of deaf saviorism that happens. Like, as a deaf person, I don't need to be saved for myself, and I don't need pity because I can't hear, and I don't need Jesus to, to fix me. Like, I'm fine being deaf. It's actually a benefit for me. I can sleep through anything. Um, I can just turn off my hearing aids and not have to pay attention to y'all. Um, but really, like, I think there's, there is a mentality in all fields of disability that we have to fix a kid. And as, as, a, as a deaf person, I don't need to be fixed. I need the systems that surround me to be fixed. And so I say like, the interpreter isn't there for me. The interpreter is there for you because you can't give me access. So they're not because I'm deaf, they're because you can't sign. I can't ever learn to hear. Even with a cochlear implant in my head, I will never be fully hearing. I can hear better, but I can never hear everything. You can learn to sign. I can't learn to hear. So I like to flip those tables. Um, the problem here is not that deaf child. The problem is the system is not set up for that deaf child to be included. 
And inclusion is not just sitting a kid in the room. Inclusion is being a full member of that community. Does that kid have the opportunity to go play with friends? Can the friends communicate with them? Do they know the gossip? Do they know the secret? Can they make stupid kid mistakes? Y'all have done some stupid things growing up. Like, does my kid have the opportunity to do that? And if not, it's not full inclusion. And so like flipping that conversation that it's not my quote, broken deaf kid there, it's this system is broken for them. What do we do to fix it? And I think that that flip, flipping that narrative, it, it helps. I think the same thing has happened with other marginalized identities. You know, like when we think about how we are flipping our understanding of DEI, it's not, it's what have we done as white people that was the problem. And how do we fix us first? And so I think that same thing is true with disability. I will try to speak to the point of, as someone who does not have the disability that I work with, um, really acknowledging and giving them the power to make decisions for themselves. Depending on their age, it's gonna be supported or guided perhaps. Um, but really checking myself and my own biases and where I come from and understanding that they get to have a voice. Do you identify as visually impaired? Do you identify as blind? Do you just not want to tell anyone? And that's how we're going to go and I'm going to take their lead. Um, I very much so believe that it's my job to put myself out of a job so that as they graduate and become in a high school, middle school, high school, they're good self-advocators. They're able to access what they need to access so they don't need me. I'm not, like, I don't go with them to college, but that they are able to be members of our society and function in the way they need to function. I completely agree that it is the system and the structures outside of that human being that need to adjust and not our students. Um, and so I think to have a colleague who does not feel the same way as I do, it's really giving them those opportunities to see how my perspective or the way I've done things and, and advocate for students um, has better outcomes, perhaps, um, but yeah. And, and with that, I mean, I think along those same lines, that teacher has to take ownership of that kid. If that teacher doesn't see the kid with vision loss as their student, they will not get it, okay? And same for, I think, for DHH as well. So that ownership has to take place, and that means that I have to step back at some point and say, what are you gonna do? You didn't get your stuff adapted in time. You changed your plans. How are we gonna make this accessible for this kid? Even simple things like um, giving the, the teacher the braille worksheet to hand to the student. Because that teacher is handing worksheets to everybody else. So the more ownership you can get that educator, the more they're gonna take ownership and care about that student. Uh, the last thing I will talk about are, you know, the expectations that we have for these students. And so, um, I have a student who has uh, a difficulty to time writing and the writing process and getting thoughts down on paper, but has A's, has fours in the standards based grading, and I hear the tone again. Um, but so they're, uh, <laughs> that, that's 32 decibels. Um, so, you know, the student has this difficulty writing, but has gotten stellar grades on everything. So I have to go and say, so what's your criteria? Are you grading them differently? And I'm like, well, you know, she did the best she could, so she got the four. I'm like, well, no, that's not what we're going for here. She's in the gen ed classes, regular level, honors level, whatever it may be. Grade them the same, like we're going on the same. If accommodations are made, if the assignment is appropriate and accessible, great, the same. So there is some of that sympathy in those gen ed teachers, um, but it's my job to advocate, say, hey, we want that playing field level. You don't need to, yeah, denying access to improving, because you're not, she's not gonna improve if you said she's fine. And she's gonna get to college and not be able to do it. <laughs> yes, hopefully, but yeah. I'd say the other thing from my perspective is I, I'm a huge believer in role models and that we need to see successful people who experience life like us. And so many families 
want their kids to be fully mainstream and living a quote normal life but that's isolating i never have anybody to experience the same or to teach me or to share the emotions that i have um those who are in deaf ed know that i am a camp director i continue to do that even though it is 16 hours from here and it is a lot of work and it is my summertime gone because I believe that the 109 kids who come to camp need strong deaf leaders to see and go, that's me. And the, the deaf adults that we have at camp who are our counselors are, we have cochlear implants and hearing aids and signing and a huge spectrum of diversity. And my kids can come to camp and just be kids for a week. They aren't the deaf kid they're just a kid there and they can look at the adults and see themselves as that person in a few years and for me that was that was a life-changing moment it's why i am very public about my hearing loss because i know that people who know i have hearing loss will look at me and go that's the experience i had I never knew another teacher. I never knew somebody had this, this, or this. I'm really open about my ADHD for the same reason. I was very open about um, my postnatal depression because I think the more we normalize our experience as diverse people, the more we go, ah, I can still thrive. Um, and about those role models, too, I was talking to one of the teachers um, who sat at a program at a school before she's at the one she is now. Um, all of the teachers in that program were hearing, and they're deaf ed teachers, but they were all hearing, and all of the paraprofessionals were deaf. So one of the students said, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a paraprofessional, because they didn't have any role models of teachers who were deaf. And so she had to explain to that student that if you want to be a paraprofessional, that's great but you can also be a teacher, or you can also be you know, this, this, and this, just because you don't see someone right now who has stepped in that role does not mean you can't do it. Um, so it's also, if, you know, especially when that student gets into middle school and high school and they start figuring out career paths that they want to go into, not only finding role models for that student, um, just in general, who has the same disability or hearing loss as they do, but finding them a role model in the career path that they are going into um, or showing them examples of it so they don't think, oh, I'll just do this position because I've seen someone that they can do maybe you know teaching or something more than that that they didn't even think that they would be able to do just because they haven't seen someone who is deaf do that before. So as student teachers, how has your experiences compared to your other friends or co-teachers in a gen ed classroom? <laughs> so my roommate is actually an elementary education major, so we talk about it all the time, how it's so different, but one thing that we love to talk about is the IP, so, you know, we go into depth, and she's like, I don't know anything about this, and I'm like, well, let's talk about it, so <laughs> we're going to depth to IP, but one thing that I found interesting is just the language that we're taught with it, like, this student will, that's what they're gonna do, she's like, in elementary, this student will be able to, and I'm, I'm just like, I would've gotten an F on that assignment if I would've put that on an IP, but anyway, um, I always talk about how, when I was there, I had, two, three students in a classroom at a time, she's teaching 30 kids. And it's definitely different because I can focus more on differentiating my instruction, on meeting their needs, whereas if one student kind of falls behind, she's gonna try, but 29 kids get it. So I feel like I'm gonna add That's a great, yeah. And yeah, I don't know anything specifically, but it's, it's a different world. We focus on different guys. things. Gen Ed student teachers are getting one class? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I've had four, sorry. I've had four different experiences. Well, it's online, so I don't count that. But, you know, <laughs> online is. the truth is, of the field now. 
else. Yes. Yeah. Um, she's had one experience. She went into her classroom. She has one experience. That's the only thing she knows. It's a second grade classroom. She doesn't want second grade. I have did third grade, kindergarten, high school, high school, but math and then English and like AP English. And that's another thing. They don't. You can't teach all everything. So. When she's focusing on math, and she's taking three math classes, and she's taking a science class, and a world history class, we're teaching language, speed, not uh, speech sometimes, not really our main focus, things like that. And I'm going into an AP class, and they're telling me, like, you're teaching the Poison One Bible a 700 page book. And I'm like, I'm gonna do what now? So I feel like sometimes it varies. So I, I can implement the language, we're gonna be vocab focused, and she's like, I'm gonna teach him two plus two. So it's like things like that that is just so different. Like the depth versus, I mean, right. they, I say we go this way and she goes this way. So it's definitely two completely different worlds. I'm going to say that I am both a gen ed and a deaf ed because I have just done too much education in my life. Uh, the great thing when I was a middle school, like a seventh grade middle school science and math teacher is I would have those kids for one year. And you had that kid that you're like, it's day 180 to go. It's 54 days to go. 33 days to go, two more days and you're gone. I will have your sibling later, but you're gone in two days. Deaf and blind kids follow us forever. <laughs> you have that kid come in in preschool and you're like, you're my life now. <laughs> hey, but if you're itinerant, it's maybe like Monday. So it's like, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's, you don't see this often, but you, you're yeah. like, it's forever. And I will tell you like one of, one of the kids that I started when he entered the program at three years old on going to his wedding. And his mom is still calling me up and she's like, hey, North Carolina isn't allowing him to become the firefighter. He's passed all of his tests, his tests, but they say he's deaf and he can't. And I'm like, oh, I haven't taught him in eight years. Why are you calling me? Like, contact this person, this person, this person. But you're the person who knows everybody. I moved to Illinois. <laughs> But they're, they're, and, and it sounds awful, but I love it too. Like, I have relationships with people forever. I don't know if that's great or not, but I mean, it is something that is special for us. Sometimes, sometimes it's, I mean, it is fun to watch a kid go from two to three words to this vibrant adult who's getting married. Like, I have to explain reproduction to him, and now he's getting married, you know? Um, but that's a really cool thing that I think general education will see people come back. Like, the high school kids will go back to the elementary and be like, you were my favorite teacher, I love you, but we're like lifelong. I love, I love it, hate it, love it, hate it. <laughs> Depends the day. <laughs> I, I just want you guys to understand. Your gen ed counterparts, sorry, your gen ed counterparts are getting maybe one, maybe two undergrad classes in all of special ed. How much do you think they're learning about DHH and LBB? Like maybe one hour. You, you are their primary instructor when it comes to all things DHH and LBB. So, and, and this is like your age people coming out are getting one or two classes. People that are 50, and have never had a vision kit or that? Three years ago, they didn't have a requirement for special ed or secondary ed. Correct. We are the best education program in the state, and there was no requirement for yeah. a special education 101 class. So, I mean, you've got to be aware of the lack of knowledge that you're going to be going into in most cases. Yeah. And sometimes it's ignorance, and sometimes it's not. Absolutely. So, Oh, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's something also I've noticed when talking to my friends who are in general education um, and now in their student teaching placements is they're dealing with behaviors in the classroom and they're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I'm like, uh, I'm deaf guard period, not LPS, but in the four placements that I've been in, I mean, one was online, so not really count, but. In the four placements that I've been in so far, 
at least two of my students in all of those placements have had ADHD or autism or learning disability or something cognitive where it wasn't just the language and the deafness and the linguistics. It was so much more than that too. So when this, one of my friends is telling me, oh, my student threw a marker against the wall and it exploded and I looked at this student and I told him, I was like, that's, that's abnormal for you? <laughs> like, it doesn't happen like that's not something that you're used to handling behaviors, you know? So um, you go from just, you know, they're now learning how to deal with behaviors. That's something that they don't really tell you in low vision and blind and in deaf and hard of hearing. They don't tell you you're gonna handle that stuff, but you do and you learn how to. Um, so it's dealing with those things, uh, especially in general education. They're talking about, let's get this content across and make it interesting so you don't have the, you know, behavior stuff, but the behavior stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, special education, it happens. It's going to happen, no matter how interesting your lesson is. How good you it out. I'm sorry. One other, one other thing is, my first day at Bridgewood's, um, the Bradley kids came in, and it was great. And we were all at the office, we had a bunch of paperwork, and they're like, oh my gosh, like, what are you teaching? And they're like, science, I'm a science teacher, or I'm in the history department, and they're like, what are you teaching? I'm like, deaf ed, and they're like, they have that here? Deaf? Yes, deaf? yeah, that's the first one, they're like, wait, what class are you teaching? I'm like, no, like, I'm with a deaf ed teacher, and they're like, they have those in public schools? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, yes, yes, we do have them, and there's actually two classrooms, but they're in the foreign language hallway, and they're at the end of the hallway, and you probably pass it all the time and don't know where that we're here. Yeah. And you, you know, to general education's benefit, like we do not know the content like they know. Like go find Iraq on a map. How many of you can do it? <laughs> Two. Okay, you know, like, I mean, that's the truth. Like we, we don't know the content as deep as they know it. And that is their expertise, but we know deafness. So how do we relate together? And I will tell you my first experience as a, as a public school teacher, I had somebody say, those kids are mine first. As a general education teacher, their right is my class first. I know the content, I know the grade, I know the skills. They're coming to my classroom. And I felt like, who are you? <laughs> like that is my deaf student. The IEP says that they will be taught by me. And I will fully admit that I was wrong. Um, my student gained five years in two. With that teacher for two years, we looped from third to fourth grade. Um, she knew the content. She knew how to teach those elementary kids that I didn't want to work with because I am a seventh grade teacher. Um, she knew it and I knew deafness and she picked up everything I would teach her. And I would sit and I'd absorb from her and I'm like, man, I didn't know you could do, I didn't know that. <laughs> this is third grade. <laughs> so I mean, learn from each other. There is so much that you can learn. If you are working with a second grader, go into the general education classroom, sit there and absorb because you're gonna notice like, ooh, we had our bar set too low. And our kids are gonna fall even further behind because we are not pushing. And so don't be afraid to go in and be like, I don't know this. Explain it to me first. Help me because I have to help them and I don't know what I'm doing. I can add to that, uh, having a student that was in college algebra trig, my first year teaching out of college, and so I know the Braille code, I know the Braille math code, I'm really good at math, but like, I'm not the expert in college algebra trig. Actually, it was pre-calc, it was pre-calc. So, <laughs> so we made a horseshoe and the math teacher sat across from me, the students sat on the end of the table and I sat up here and we looped the information and I translated the Braille Mammoth and said, oh, you write it this way, this is how it'll be structured and formatted. Content went back to the expert. You know, over the years, I can very well easily teach algebra on college algebra training now, uh, geometry, I could teach algebra too, I could do the gen ed class without the certification, but I could teach it. <laughs> it's not my job. And so I love going in and co-teaching. 
I love co-teaching and giving the supports, and I can support lots of people, but I make sure the code is there, that they have access, they have the format, they know the signs. Hey, remember that the uh, approximately is the squiggly equal sign, so it's this indicator, this sign, this indicator, this sign. Here's how you set it up. Just remind them of the code, how to write their answer accurately, and I can, you know, let the teacher teach and make sure that it's accessible. By doing so, the math teachers at UHI are so articulate on how to describe what's happening on the board. I don't have to intervene. I would be sitting over there and whisper, well, the graph is, has an end behavior of, as x goes to infinity, the y goes to negative infinity, and I'm explaining it. But if I just interject and I'm able to kind of do a co-teaching moment and interject it loudly for the whole class to hear, it modeled it for that gen ed teacher. They now, like, oh, I should have said it that way. They model and they say everything in an articulate way that's good for all the students. It reinforces that content vocabulary. It reinforces what's going on in their paper if they have the braille notes ahead of time. So it's been those working relationships to collaborate their expertise with my expertise. And it's fun. Another thing to add on like teaching subjects that you don't know, it's perfectly fine to say you don't know. So I had one student, I'm teaching science, I'm teaching phases of the moon, and I don't care, like I don't know anything about this. So I'm like looking up, I'm learning as I'm doing the PowerPoint, but you try to do a little outside of what you're teaching them, but you can't cover everything in one night. And this student asked me a question about the moon, and I'm like, couldn't tell you, I have no idea. So we, it's a perfect learning moment because sometimes these students don't even know how to work the internet, how do they find a reliable source. So you go over to the computer and you get out of the PowerPoint and you search what the question is and you explain. I'm typing it this way because you're not gonna type a complete sentence in a novel into a Google search bar. And then I'm explaining what, why I'm picking this one or I'm looking at this link and I'm also gonna look at this one because sometimes you gotta look at the date, it could be outdated, It could this could be wrong, or I wanna check multiple sources to see if they're both saying the same thing. So just because you don't know, it's not like, they're like, oh my gosh, this person doesn't know what they're doing. It's like, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna teach them something else. They're gonna learn something else from this even though I didn't know the answer at the time. Mic drop. <laughs> 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 right. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, we okay. Do that. This is the language problem. We just add, 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 add. We're around each other all the time. We literally live on, oh, she's the top bunk, so in case you wanted to know, so. We're, we're together a lot. Yeah. Um, no, it's something too, when I was creating my PowerPoints and content for my students, don't just pick the clip art, because then your students only know the picture in clip art. They don't know the real life picture. So we're teaching about trees, and you're teaching about all the different plants, and that's a flower, and that's a grain, and that's a pine tree, that's a conifer. Don't just pick the clip art. Pick the actual picture so that when you're teaching the PowerPoint, and then you go outside and see it, the student can connect those two. You can throw off the clip art picture, absolutely, but don't just do the clip art, because then that student only knows the clip art picture, and they'll never connect it to real life. The actual object, like when she said, go outside and see it, like make sure they actually see it. And if it is something really weird, like let them touch it and like feel so they understand those type of things as well. That was so off topic of the question. <laughs> <laughs> this elementary compared to tap head. No, that's perfect. That's, that's, that's good. We're going around. <laughs> Are there uh, any more questions? Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have anything else to add before we end for tonight? Okay. Well, uh, thank you to the audience for coming out tonight. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you to our panelists. And we give a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. for you, LDS and IT people, for being brave and coming. Yes, thank you very much. All right. Let me see that. <laughs> okay, so I live, I live with IT, and I'm going to tell you that my poor husband has a mom who is a teacher of the blind and a wife who is a teacher of the deaf. 
And the man has become an expert in all things special ed technology, whether he likes it or not, and is like the go-to. It is a really good place to like knit your career, um, because there's a lot of spaces that no one knows needs to get filled, and all of a sudden you've got like these great designers who are doing these great um, instructional things online, but nothing's described or nothing's captioned, or there's technology glitches, and if you know the disability world, it actually enhances everything for everybody. So when you have questions, which I'm, I'm sure you will someday, um, we're over on DeGarmo fifth floor. We're all neighbors. They put the deaf and the blind program right next to each other, just like they always do in the schools, um, because they can't tell us apart. <laughs> so just come over to the don't be afraid. Um, we don't bite too hard. And if the secretary is supposed to be your best friend, IT is your best friend. Yeah, those are I uh, say your, your secretary, your yes, custodian, custodian, and your IT. Those custodian. are like your three when best they friends. Ask, when they ask who is the team, you're going to tell them the other teachers, the paraprofessionals, interpreters, the secretaries, the IT, and the custodians. <laughs> They're a part of your child's team. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, everyone.